This is for the ethics review class at Parker University. We've just finished talking about the four elements of a malpractice claim and how difficult it may be for a, a, a patient to pursue a, a chiropractic malpractice claim. It may be so expensive, it's not worth pursuing. So in that context, let's talk about risk management for just a brief second here. The idea of risk management is not to eliminate any chance you will ever be sued for chiropractic malpractice. The purpose of risk management is to take reasonable steps to protect yourself from risk that are too great and to minimize the risk where appropriate. So for example, just a couple of examples of good risk management strategies. Now, of course, there's a lot more than what I've got here, but just a few things to think about. The first is, be alert to stroke symptoms. Uh, remember fast, facial drooping, uh, unable to raise their arm, speech difficulty, that means it's time to call 911. Pay attention when patients come into your office. If a patient is demonstrating these symptoms and complaining about a headache, do not perform a chiropractic adjustment for them. Call 911 and make arrangements to get them appropriate medical care because they may be having a stroke before you've ever done anything to them. Uh, on the other hand, if you adjust a patient and they begin to experience these symptoms after your adjustment, it doesn't necessarily mean that your adjustment caused the stroke. It may just be sheer coincidence. It may be that the patient was going to have a stroke whether they received that adjustment or not. Whatever the situation is, if a patient is experiencing these symptoms, don't panic. Uh, call 911, make arrangements to get the patient to appropriate care. Uh, some of the worst malpractice cases uh, involve situations where the doctor responds inappropriately. Uh, for example, there are some situations, there was one case where the uh, patient was experiencing the symptoms of a stroke the doctor chose to have the patient lay in a quiet room, turn the lights off, and give the patient a chance to rest for a little bit to see if the symptoms went away. Uh, unfortunately, the doctor and his staff forgot about that patient and went home for the night, leaving the patient in a dark room having a stroke. Uh, that obviously results in a large settlement. There are, is another case where the doctor chose to uh, recognized that the patient was not well and chose to take the patient to their home. Well, the patient, uh, no one else was home to let the patient in. The patient couldn't find their key. So the doctor left the patient having symptoms of a stroke, left the patient on their front porch. That, uh, again, was a situation that results in a large settlement. Uh, so if you ever run into a situation where a patient is experiencing these symptoms, be alert to it. React appropriately if these symptoms are there. The other thing I'll tell you about risk management is often your best way to protect yourself from malpractice is to have good documentation. Uh, make sure it's thorough, make sure it's complete, make sure it's accurate. And if you have good documentation, one of the first things the plaintiff's lawyer is going to evaluate is your documentation. And if it's good and complete and demonstrates you did not commit malpractice, that suit, that claim may never result in a lawsuit being filed. The attorney may abandon the claim and advise the client, your patient, that it's simply not worth pursuing. Uh, some things to think about. Uh, certainly, it's appropriate to use abbreviations in your documentation, but make sure you have a key for those abbreviations. That helps you and your staff to use abbreviations consistently. By providing that key with the records, it also helps somebody looking at the records interpret them accurately. Put some steps in place to monitor whether your billing records match your clinical records. For example, you should not be billing for patients or billing for visits that are not reflected in the clinical records. You should not be billing for services that are not reflected in the clinical records. Besides the issues about insurance fraud that 
that creates. It creates an appearance in a malpractice case that the doctor was uh, uh, not being very honest in the way that they were handling billing, which also makes the jury wonder, that, wonder whether the doctor is being honest uh, in what he's telling the jury. Uh, records can be changed, but make sure they are changed in an appropriate way. Uh, the correct way to make changes to paper records is to make an entry in the next daily notes, put down today's date, and notify or, or describe which record should be corrected. Uh, it's expected that you will make mistakes in records, and it's expected that you should correct those mistakes. By the way, don't change those records just because you got served with a subpoena or received a demand letter. You should be making those changes on an ongoing basis when you become aware of mistakes in your records. If you receive a notice of claim, a, a demand letter, or a subpoena or, or a citation that a lawsuit has been filed, don't make those changes without consulting with your malpractice insurance company. Work with them, that the insurance company, and if necessary, work with their attorney to be careful that you are making appropriate changes and that you're making them in the appropriate way, especially after you've received notice of a claim. What about just losing records? Sometimes losing a few pages out of a file or losing the entire file or making changes in such a way that you obliterate the old record. That creates an impression and I think most jurors seeing that situation are going to make an assumption that the doctor is trying to hide something. So be very careful as you make changes that you do not obliterate the old record and be very careful that you have procedures in place to prevent files from being lost. From time to time you should inventory your files to be sure that nothing is missing or misfiled. That prevents the problem where a file gets misplaced and accidentally gets destroyed when it should not be destroyed. So think about some other risk management strategies. Certainly using appropriate uh, uh, forms in your practice is a key part of it. We've already talked about informed consent and I cannot emphasize enough how important that good doctor-patient relationship is in protecting yourself from malpractice claims. Take the time to develop a rapport with the patient so that the patient knows enough about you to have some trust and so that they like you. Malpractice lawyers will tell you that patients never ever walk into their office and say, I really like the doctor, but I need to sue him anyway but they often walk into the office saying, I really don't like the doctor. Can we find some reason to sue him? That's typically the way the malpractice claim begins. The patient likes you, that first step never occurs. And even if a mistake occurs, unless the patient's able to demonstrate all four of the elements of a malpractice claim, they're not gonna be able to pursue it successfully. So be a little bit worried about uh, risk management and chiropractic malpractice, but don't be overly worried about it or overly stressed about it.